scapular fractures. It is a high energy injury with an increase in the injury severity score. 50% involves the body and the spine. 10% involves the glenoid fossa. It usually occurs from a high energy trauma with about 80 to 90% associated injuries. There is a high association with rib fractures. Head injury, ipsilateral extremity injury, pulmonary contusion, pneumothorax, and hemothorax. The pulmonary injury is about 37%. So an isolated scapular fracture is really a marker for possible injury to the chest region. You need to admit these patients and observe them for the pulmonary complications. There is about 10% neurovascular deficit, and this injury of the scapula can be missed or the diagnosis can be delayed in about 10% of the patients. 90% of fractured scapula are minimally displaced or non-displaced, and the treatment is non-surgical. Most scapular fractures are treated conservatively, even if the fracture is moderately displaced. You're going to give them a sling, Cartman exercises for two weeks. Then advise the patient to do active and passive range of motion. Classification of scapular fracture is based on the fracture location. I'm going to mention to you three extraarticular fractures that are very important. Number one, a chromial fracture that is displaced and the subacromial space is compromised. This fracture probably will need surgery. The crocoid fracture that occurs proximal to the CC ligament. This fracture is usually associated with other injuries to the superior shoulder suspensory complex. This fracture may need surgery. The third fracture is fracture of the scapular neck with a clavicle fracture. The management of this fracture is controversial. Most of clavicle fractures and scapular fractures are treated conservatively, even if the fracture is moderately displaced. There is a classification for these injuries, and please look at my video for detailed explanation of the classification. And here is the link. Most of the treatment is a sling and early range of motion. You give the patient a sling, you send them to therapy, and you do progressive range of motion, and the union will occur in about six weeks with little or no functional deficit. How about the surgical indication? The goal of surgery is to achieve stability of the shoulder joint and restore the function of the rotator cuff. When do you do the surgery? You do it when there's an involvement more than 25% of the glenoid with humeral head subluxation. Or if you have interarticular fracture with a step off more than five millimeter, or if there is a major gap in the joint. For the neck of the scapula, you do the surgery if there is more than 40 degree angulation or one centimeter translation, or if you have excessive medialization of the glenoid. What is the approach you're gonna use? The approach you're going to use is based on the major fracture fragment displacement. Anterior approach for anterior rim fractures, like bony bankert. Try to avoid injury to the axillary nerve. 
The posterior approach, it's a tough dissection, usually is done through a straight posterior approach or a modified Jodé approach. The straight posterior approach is used through a transverse incision over the spine of the scapula and you detach the posterior deltoid and you go in the interval between the teres minor and the infraspinatus. The straight posterior approach is used for fractures of the posterior glenoid, the scapular neck, or the lateral border of the scapula. The modified Jodé approach, you begin at the acromion, then you course along the spine of the scapula, then you angle the incision down along the vertebral border of the scapula. The Jodé approach is used for more complex fractures of the scapula. Don't do excessive traction of the infraspinatus, otherwise you're going to injure the suprascapular nerve. And don't go in the interval below the teres minor, otherwise you're going to injure the axillary nerve. Sometimes you go through the infraspinatus between the lower part of the muscle and the major part of the muscle. Injury of the superior shoulder suspensory complex. Some people name that injury a floating shoulder because the glenohumeral joint is without attachment to the rest of the skeleton. And others call it the superior shoulder suspensory complex injury. Actually, you need to decide if that injury is stable or unstable. Unstable injury probably will need surgery. Typically, it is a scapular neck fracture plus clavicle fracture. And because it's easier to plate the clavicle than to fix the scapula, so in the past, the treatment of the floating shoulder was RIF of the clavicle, then evaluate the scapular fracture usually by a CT scan, but they found that the sling has an equivalent outcome or even superior outcome than the surgery. So there is no support for surgery just because you have a floating shoulder. So they came to the conclusion that surgical stabilization only with a specific indication to that fracture. It means if the clavicle fracture meets a criteria of fixation, you fix it. If the glenoid meets the criteria of fixing it, then you fix it. Scapulothoracic dissociation is another injury of the scapula. It's a lateral displacement of the scapula plus a soft tissue injury, plus a neurovascular injury. So it's almost like a closed four-quarter amputation. The scapula is torn and moves laterally, and when it moves laterally, there may be a fractured clavicle that's distracted, or AC joint injury, or a sternoclavicular joint injury. The x-ray will show you the lateral displacement of the scapula. Check the patient carefully. The subclavian artery and the brachial plexus could be injured. The brachial plexus is torn first before the artery, so there are more brachial plexus injury than arterial injury. The outcome for the patient will depend on the neurological status of the patient.